Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the MyCP webinar series, our set of uh, community-focused webinars that are intended to uh, be a place to educate you and hear your input about the research that we're conducting within the Cerebral Palsy Research Network. I'm your host this evening. My name is Paul Gross, and I am the president and CEO and co-founder of the CP Research Network. And tonight, we will be talking about uh, assessing pain in adults with cerebral palsy uh, as part of one of the many projects that we have going on in the network. I'm very uh, excited to have uh, Dr. Mary Gennady with us from uh, the University of Hartford and Dr. Gary Noritz from Nationwide Children's and Ohio State University to talk about this important topic. Uh, so the agenda for tonight is I always give a quick introduction uh, about the, the CP Research Network. Those of you that have attended lots can feel free to tune out for about six minutes. I do have two extra slides that I'm going to provide because I want to make sure people really understand a little bit about quality improvement. And then I will hand it over uh, to Dr. Gennady. Um, Gennady, I just said Gennady, getting my G's and hard G's and soft G's messed up. And then we'll go into a Q&A. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about CPRN founding. And I'm very intentionally saying CPRN because we refer to ourselves now as the CP Research Net Network as a function of our merger, which I will talk about. So we were founded out of an NIH workshop uh, that both, oh, let, me, uh, let me actually do a mute all really quickly. Um, Please do not discourage her. Anything to discourage her. She didn't major philosophy and fuel. And my mute all button is not working. There we go. I think I muted everyone now. Sorry. Um, Okay, so we were born out of a workshop that happened uh, on the state of the science uh, and treatment in cerebral palsy that happened in late November uh, 2014. And actually, uh, that's where I met uh, Dr. Gennady and uh, Dr. Noritz. So um, it was a sort of a famous start. What was interesting about that meeting was the organizers of the meeting got up at the end and they said, we heard five big things that needed to move forward and they actually assigned people to groups to move these things forward. One was to start a national cerebral palsy registry, which is quite difficult in a country without socialized medicine, to pursue more clinical research that was focused on comparing uh, different interventions, to increase the study of adults with CP, to grow the field by bringing in new young clinician scientists or, or researchers into the field, and to advance basic and translational science so the things that happens in labs and in animals before it gets to uh, being a, a real treatment for people with CP. So we were founded to do one through four, uh, but now with the addition of uh, Dr. Michael Kerr and the work that we're doing in genetics, we actually are doing a little bit of all five, although a lot more could certainly happen in advancing basic science. Uh, it was really the merger of two core experiences, uh, I have a 16-year-old son with both cerebral palsy and hydrocephalus uh, and had co-founded a clinical research network for hydrocephalus called HCRN that was very transformative to the way uh, uh, hydrocephalus was treated. And then Dr. Noritz had this experience of a single center registry at Nationwide where the data was collected right into the electronic medical record through uh, standard visits. And this really struck a chord as a, as a uh, great way to form a registry. It was a patient-centered from the outset with both uh, my leadership as a parent and with Michelle Schusterman, uh, who we partnered with from the very beginning to organize our uh, community advisors. Uh, so some key milestones for us as we launched that registry in March of 2016, and now it's got over 5,000 patients and is growing uh, daily. Uh, the registry elements, so the things that define our registry were actually taken by EPIC, the leading provider of, of electronic medical record systems. So lots of sites have our registry. And we currently have 18 sites that are collecting either part of their data on part of their CP population or their whole CP population. Uh, one of the first things we did being patient-centered was we wanted to work on things that the patient community, community members uh, with CP cared about. So we organized a patient-centered research agenda 
um, shaping process. We were funded by PCORI and we published the results of that in 2018. And that really drives uh, a, you know, our work and what we will focus our energies on. We've had some significant public funding milestones, uh, including support for the registry infrastructure from the Pediatric Epilepsy Research Foundation uh, and from the National Institutes of Health through the uh, study that uh, Dr. Michael Kruger was funded for to look at the genetics of CP. Uh, we launched a community registry or patient powered registry, they're sometimes called, in March of 2019. That's got over a thousand participants. And for all of those of you on the call, if you haven't joined MyCP and participated in that, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, it's split roughly equally between adults with CP and caregivers of children with CP. Uh, and it, is, uh, it runs a cross-sectional longitudinal study of adults that has over uh, 220 enrolled patients when I checked last night, and, uh, but we're trying to get to 500. Uh, we have four quality improvement initiatives, and we're going to talk about one of those tonight, the one focused on adult care, uh, and I'll talk about the differentiation between quality improvement and research. Uh, and we've had four publications to date, but uh, we have, um, and 20 uh, academic presentations, but we have more than eight manuscripts that are in development, and you'll get a sense of that in a moment. So CP Now, which many of you have heard of, launched at the same time that we started CPRN uh, with the CP Toolkit, a great guide for parents that get a new diagnosis of CP. Uh, that was a 501c3 or a nonprofit that was founded by Michelle Schusterman. And in that year, uh, she received the, the next year, she received the Making a Difference Award from the American Academy for Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine. Uh, she was the partner for CPRN to do research CP. Subsequent to that, launched a well-being guide, a resource for parents, and then went on to translate that toolkit into both Spanish and Portuguese. And then as part of their, their mission, they started funding research as of 2018. And in 2020, they funded a research CP uh, grant program that we uh, executed through the network. So now CP Now is focused on both wellness programs, education, and now it has as of January merged with CPRN to form the CP Research Network. So this was four sites coming together, four different, uh, a lot of different programs, and our mission is to optimize the lifelong health and wellness of people with cerebral palsy and their families through both high quality research and quality improvement and education and community programming. So what is it? So we're now a 501c3. We have a data coordinating center that's based at the University of Utah, which means that's where our data for our registry goes. It hosts both clinical and community registries that I've talked about. And then we do education and well-being programs. One of our biggest programs is MyCP. And this is a portal that's embedded within CPRN and can be used to give you a very personalized experience uh, about information about your, your cerebral palsy. Uh, it allows you to participate in our community registry by taking surveys from the comfort of your phone or your computer and participate with uh, clinicians and researchers in discussions about research, uh, as well as providing those personalized resources and access to our fitness program. So I would encourage everyone that is not already a member to sign up at mycp.org. Okay, so... We have two registries. This is quickly to just give you one data point. This is prior to us having 5,000. You can see this is the distribution of gross motor function classification scale across the population that we have in the, the, uh, in the network, in the registry. It's not a population-based surveillance. It does not represent what we would find in the United States overall. It's a treatment-oriented registry, so it finds who are the people that are going to the hospitals in the network. And then as an example, just to give you a sense of the clinic of the community registry, it actually has 1300 members, but only about a thousand of which are either people with CP or caregivers to people with CP. We really actually invite in, you can see the provider community. We have 176 providers there and a number of them very often chime in to provide the evidence base for the discussions going on in the MyCP forum. So, that sort of summarizes the, uh, the um, programs that we have. We're very focused on community engagement in, in research. And so that's a, a key thing. So this is 
a picture of the 45 people that assembled in Chicago in 2017, and then a picture of uh, our, our a number of our researchers that were hosted in Michigan the last time we were able to do a face-to-face -face meeting in May of 20, uh, 2019. And then our two uh, toolkits down on the left, my CP, and then our health and well-being programs. So where are we? We're spread across uh, the United States. The green pins represent sites that are actively collecting data. The yellow pins are working through some of the technology. The red pins are working through some of the compliance uh, and getting to the technology. And the blue pins are sites that have signed up and said they want to join the network. And that is the wrong direction. And it's backing up that way more. Let me see if I can fix that. Okay, so our goal is to accelerate research. Uh, and as you can see, this is our pipeline that goes from the left with a concept where we want as many concepts to come to us as possible. And they go through a review process and an approval process to get through to funding and to implementation. Uh, the green ovals are all of our research projects. You can see how many uh, projects we have in the manuscript pipeline and our four publications there. The orange circles are our quality improvement initiatives. The transition one is paused right now. So you see we have one on dystonia diagnosis. Last month's webinar was on our hip surveillance. Tonight, we're going to be talking about our adult center QI. And then we have one on intrathecal baclofen pump infections. Uh, so we're really just trying to grow the amount of multi-center clinical research that is happening. So I want to just spend a moment to clarify the difference between research and quality improvement. Uh, both achieve finding outcomes, improving outcomes. They do it in very different mechanisms. So whereas research will test a formal hypothesis and determine whether or not it is true, QI is much more sort of systems-based and it'll assess uh, a process or uh, a whole system for producing a health outcome. Uh, it, it has a very different starting point in terms of uh, the, the way you set up, it, it's much faster. So one of the things you do is you get a, a bit of information about established standards and then you make simple changes and you monitor uh, the outcome. So the benefit of research is uh, you are getting generalizable knowledge uh, that, that um, may, not, may or may not benefit the, the subjects in the study. Whereas in QI, everyone that is participating benefits from that. Um, it's not necessarily generalizable, but it means at the site where we're doing the QI, there is improvement and there are ways to spread that improvement broadly. Uh, there is no risk associated with QI um, because it's the standard uh, risk of care. We're just, uh, in, we're just making changes to uh, standard care. And so other than confidentiality, there is uh, no risk other than the, the standard risk of entering a clinic and, and getting uh, treatment. Um, and they both have systematic data collection. Um, so the endpoint for research is to answer a question, uh, whereas the endpoint for uh, quality improvement is to improve a program, improve an outcome. Um, and one of the things that's most important about it is the timeline for it is that it is continuous. So a, a, a research study typically ends at the, uh, um, at the end of about five years, and then the data is analyzed and, and the results are produced, whereas for QI, it is ongoing. So it is a process for continuous improvement. And so the network was founded to do both QI and research. We focus a little more heavily on research in our first five years. We're now trying to balance that out. And when we surveyed and figured out what was most uh, important, uh, adults, ooh, adult, uh, care was one of the most important ones. So I'm excited to have uh, uh, Dr. Janati and Dr. Noritz here. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to them. Uh, uh, Mary Janati is a PT and a uh, PhD, and she is a professor at, of physical therapy at the University of Hartford. She co-leads our adult study group that is doing that, uh, that registry study. Uh, and she's been a member of the steering committee uh, ever since. Uh, the founding of the, net, the network since July of, uh, of 2015. And then Dr. Gary Noritz is, a, uh, is an MD. He's both an internist and a developmental pediatrician. So he spans the lifespan. So he, he directs the complex care program at Nationwide Children's. 
He's a professor of uh, pediatrics at Ohio State and has also been on the CPRN steering committee since it's uh, founded. So with that, I turn it over to Mary Giannotti. Okay, so thank you very much, Paul. And I have to say that this has really been the joy, a joy to be part of this group. And this is a preliminary report and it's really just on pain across the lifespan. And it's from um, some data that we presented this summer. Maybe some of you have seen it before, but hopefully we can shed, it will provide context for um, our work, our QI work. <clears throat> and we are gonna progress the slides. There we go. So we're, I'm really um, proud to be part of CPR and Research Network. And our adult work group includes a lot of folks across the country and really North America who have contributed to the work that we're doing. And we have some adults on our consumer panel. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, John Borland and June Isaacs. There's been a lot of people who have contributed to this process. And as Paul said, one of the primary issues was not only how to treat adults now, but update our treatments and therapies for children who have CP to prevent some of the secondary impairments such as pain and fatigue. That was really the number one research question that came out of the 2017 patient reported research agenda. And just to give you an idea, chronic pain is something that people with chronic neurological disability do experience, but we're finding that the rates of adults with cerebral palsy exceed even those of traumatic spinal cord injury and people with autism and Down syndrome. So certainly there's a propensity for adults with CP to um, have chronic pain. And it's a, it's a huge issue. What can we do to prevent it in, in childhood? And what can we do to treat it now? And I just wanted to bring to your attention about the pain classification scale. In 2015, we have primary pain, cancer pain, post-surgical pain, neuropathic pain, headache pain, musculoskeletal pain, and visceral pain. Well, in 2021, the NIH identified something called central pain syndrome, which basically is caused by damage to or dysfunction of the CNS. So anybody who's had any kind of uh, traumatic injury to their CNS is at rest for this type of central pain syndrome. And its mechanisms and treatments are very different than musculoskeletal pain. So how can we treat and prevent pain? Well, we thought that, you know, maybe if we got a bunch of information from the folks that had the pain, we could get some information about what works and what does not and look for some patterns for prevention and treatment. And we've been doing that with lots of big data. Um, Ed Herbert's group at Michigan has been really making headway at looking at clinic uh, outcome data. So again, we worked really hard in this sort of funnel uh, pattern of getting consensus and getting a lot of feedback and deciding, is this going to really be a set of questions that we can ask? We really wanted to ask about demographics, functional changes and pain impact. And then again, as Paul said, we want it to be cross-sectional and longitudinal and hopefully maybe linked to the clinical registry. This is a type of surveys or questionnaires that we use the PROMISE measures stand for the Patient Reported Outcome Measurement Information System. It's generated from the National Institutes of Health. Then it provides sort of like standardized information that you can look back to compare groups of people or an individual to their peers on a whole bunch of health outcomes. So they're very useful. The brief pain inventory is very useful for looking at pain. And then we tried to get some specific information about how people with CP function. So maybe we can get some more information and also information about income, employment and stigma. Cause we know all of those play a role in how you experience your disability and access care. So as Paul said, we opened it in the spring of 2019 and today we have, as Paul said, more than 200, but this analysis is looking at 196 
which is primarily female, which is not <clears throat> inconsistent with other published reports of internet sort of survey research. But we know that males have a little bit more CP than females, according to population studies. We have people that, um, you know, we have some distribution with ethnicity, but primarily white. We have distribution with work, and we have some distribution with the age range. In terms of the characteristics, you can see that we have a nice split between sort of the younger adult, the middle adult, but the older adult, it would be nice to get some more participants here. We have sort of a population distribution with gross motor classification. Um, but again, we want to hear from all the folks. So it'd be really nice to get some more people that primarily ambulate uh, or primary means of locomotion is with an assistive device or a wheelchair. Um, because if we're asking people to answer questions, most of the folks are communicating at a high level. Again, the lower the score, the more higher you're functioning. And we have some distribution in terms of the ability for people to use their hands. So I felt comfortable with that. So in terms of looking at functional changes, we can see that pretty much um, half of the folks in young adulthood are having functional changes, but then pretty much as you increase, everyone is experiencing functional changes since their best gross motor um, function in childhood. <clears throat> Most of the time it's decline. And, ex and when people talk about why they had decline or improvement, remember most of the people were declining, we can see pain as a primary reason. So that gives you a real clue into why we need to look at pain. We also ask these folk about folks about their overall well-being and their health and their stigma. And we can see that, of course, their gross motor function level was associated with their physical function and fatigue, but their age wasn't associated when, without any of their outcomes. And what we're looking for is people to be around 50, because in these standardized scores, 50 is the mean. We would expect this to be less because by defunct CP, we have some physical function changes. But we don't like that anxiety is higher than 50 or fatigue. And certainly, we don't like the fact that pain is at 60, which is one whole standard deviation higher, and stigma is a half a standard deviation. So what's going on with this whole pain thing that's making people lose function? We can see that 79% of the folks reported that they did have pain. And you can see that we have these folks here, the middle, uh, the middle folks seem to have, the middle aged or the 38 to 58, have the highest reports. Um, and then if you broke it down by assistive device, we can see pretty much the people that are using some kind of assistive device, whether it be a walker or a wheelchair, are reporting, pretty much reporting pain as compared to less pain with the people with the um, no assistive device. We also know that the presence of chronic pain is going to increase your risk for decline. When we think about where it is. We can see a lot of extremities here. We do see the neck. Um, and I think there's an abdomen somewhere. Yes, and we see an abdomen. So we have some visceral pain. And then it looks like, you know, there's some head pain. But again, the extremities in the back are, are really what's taking a, a beating here. And I'm just giving some kudos to the abdominal pain um, as that might be someone's biggest area. Gen then again, a shout out to the central pain syndrome. This kind of pain is typically constant, maybe moderate to severe, maybe worse by touch or movement, emotions, or cold temperatures. So it's also something that isn't responsive to opioids. So we need to make sure you're really evaluated appropriately. When we look at pain intensity, again, we're seeing that folks are having um, pretty moterate pain on this 10-point on this, uh, scale. 
in terms of its intensity and its interference. And there's no association of age or gross motion gross motor function with your pain intensity or interference. So pretty much pain is gonna affect everybody differently regardless of your level of function. And then we have this slide here that we can see that pain is starting early. It's um, oftentimes it's getting worse and it's rarely getting better, okay? And some of these age ranges are very low you know, two, three, you know, it's something that hasn't been addressed or is typically not addressed in childhood that should be addressed. Okay, when we look at treatments that were tried and some that worked, here's everything that was tried. And of course, I'm very biased in my analysis. You know, I think exercise is medicine and massage exercise, of course, steroids and opioids are important and is surgery but we wanna try exercise as medicine first. When we look at the overall outcomes for satisfaction with life, pain interference here, depression, anxiety, stigma, upper extremity function, lower extremity function. Now these we would assume, okay? Because maybe you're gonna have some upper extremity and lower extremity, um, capability issues because of your condition. But these sorts of things are not necessarily condition specific. But here we see that all of these outcomes are poorer than the general population. More pain, less satisfaction, more depression, um, just really, and more anxiety. Okay. What's the next? Um, this is not a complete data set, but the initial analysis is showing us that people that are using the opioids, we can see that um, the median score is four, the standard error of the mean is two, the range is zero to 27. If I just did a descriptive analysis of those that are over a nine on how they're using opioids, 25% of the folks in our sample are misusing opioids whether they're misdiagnosed or they need other treatments, it's not me to judge, I don't have their clinical records. Totally biased, choose PT. So we're seeing that the low back, the lower and upper extremities, the neck and the abdomen are sites that are very painful and that it interferes with walking, activity and mood to a great extent. The age of onset varied from early childhood to late adulthood. It mostly got worse, it rarely got better. And of course, anything that had to do with physical therapy was fantastic and bracing and surgery helped too. This is a very limited sample. We would really like to hear a sample twice as big. We'd really like to link this with Gary's data, um, that he, Dr. Norris's data that he's gonna show or the initiatives that he's showing. Um, but really it gives us some insights. It's really imperative that we address pain um, early and that we give people opportunities to move and give them appropriate diagnoses and, and, and um, options. And we need to look be on the lookout for the next generation. Just to let you know, we did an analysis of um, therapy use in older adults with CP and musculoskeletal diagnoses. Um, they have more, co adults with CP have more comorbidities and they have a lower use of PT services related to their non-CP peers. So thanks. Thank you, Mary. Dr. Noritz, you're up if you can share and then we'll do Q&A after that. I can, okay, so we'll do Q&A afterwards. Sorry, give me a quick second. I think I can do this. I have the utmost confidence. Well, we'll see. We good? We're good. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody, and thank thanks Paul for for having me. I'm Gary Noritz. I'm a uh, uh, med peds doc, as we say, at Nationwide Children's Hospital, um, and I take care of both kids and adults with CP and other uh, kinds of disabilities. Um, I have, uh, uh, our hospital especially has a big interest in using quality improvement science to improve the care of how we take care of everything. 
Um, and so it's sort of a, a big thing and a big buzzword uh, at our hospital to learn how to use this to um, uh, improve the care that you're, you're giving in whatever um, venue you're giving in. And we even sort of host a journal, uh, the, the only pediatric quality and safety journal on QI. Um, so uh, I have been working with various uh, docs from around um, and, and others from around the country and around the network to think of how we can use QI to improve uh, the care of people, adults specifically, um, with CP. Um, and uh, after several meetings, we decided what we wanted to focus on was pain, and especially pain with function. So I'm going to introduce a little bit of what we've done, but introduce a little bit uh, of quality improvement science, expand a little bit on what Paul has showed you already as to how quality uh, improvement works. Um, uh -huh, uh -huh. All right, Mary and I don't have any disclosures. Um, some of what we're, we talk about here um, in, or what I'm trying to show you a little bit is what's going on behind the scenes. Um, you know, a, a Anybody who's interacted with the medical system knows that it's an immensely complicated um, thing, um, which seems to have a mind of its own. Um, and one of the sayings we have in quality improvement is that a system is perfectly designed to achieve the outcome that it achieves. And so, uh, you know, we didn't on purpose set up a um, medical system that's extreme, extremely expensive and extremely complicated um, and is not person-centered and, uh, uh, you know, and all the, the things that we could say that are sort of to the detriment of our, um, how um, the medical system helps or doesn't help people. Um, we didn't set it up that way, but the systems that we have evolved um, are the ones that uh, make these things happen. And so if we can take apart those systems, even, you know, sort of a bit by bit, we can improve the care that um, uh, we're giving uh, people. And so um, it's not always the prettiest uh, um, uh, pro uh, process, um, but here's a little sort of glimpse of it. So we came into it sort of with this uh, task, which came from that original um, uh, research CP paper about priorities for um, adults with CP. And, uh, and we have a great lofty goal, which I think is a good one, which is we want to improve the quality of life for adults with CP. Um, that's a wonderful goal that's very hard to actualize. Like, how do you make that happen? Um, and that's where quality improvement can help us. And so I think lots of different people have sort of claimed that they uh, uh, came up with this saying that if you can measure it, you can improve it, or if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Improve it. And so what we do in quality Im improvement is figure out things that we can measure um, and uh, find ways in which um, changing those uh, processes which reduce those measurements gives us some improvement. So uh, another way to think about this is that, and sometimes when we're getting off track uh, in a uh, quality improvement meeting, both in the network and outside, you know, someone will say, hey, hey, everybody, hold on. You know, we're not trying to solve world, world hunger here. We're just trying to order lunch. Okay, it's just one piece of the puzzle. And if we can stick to our one piece of the puzzle, we can then get to the next thing. Um, here's a, a, you know, a paper, it goes along with uh, many of the uh, uh, data that uh, uh, Mary showed you, um, and I think is, uh, at least by my estimation in talking to some of you, this is the, the experience of adults with CP and that pain is there. Um, it doesn't mean we have to like it, but it is there and we need to uh, uh, acknowledge it. So I, just as an aside, sometimes what that's how I talk to um, patients and their families about it, which to say, hey, listen, this is really, really common, which is not to say that, well, it's fine, we'll just accept it because it's really common. But, you know, I do like to let people know that, you know, they're not alone and, and that we're trying. Um, uh, so uh, this is a meta-analysis, which means they put together a lot of different papers and came up with this 70% um, prevalence of pain, which seems pretty close to my experience uh, uh, having taken care of adults with CP for uh, quite a long time now. 
So quality improvement is about breaking a complicated process into less complicated parts. And so when we are teaching uh, quality improvement science, we, you need to sort of do, uh, we always use examples that are kind of universal uh, that people understand. And so here's, here's one, which is, you know, what are the steps to making a pizza? Like, if you want to make a better pizza, that's great. But like, which of these 12 steps are you going to change? That's going to get you a better pizza. Or if you're making pizza in a store, what can you do in, at each one of these steps to make the process faster or more uh, affordable or cheaper or add value to the uh, process that you're doing? And so it's not like you you would just say to the baker, go back and make a better pizza. You would, as a quality improvement person, take apart these um, uh, uh, steps and say, well, what can we do here to make this better? And so that uh, is how we kind of got started with um, uh, trying to look at a, a pain in adults with CP. Uh, we do sort of the basic unit of things that we do in quality improvement. P people have seen this before in, in various venues, I'm pretty sure. Um, uh, PDSA plan, do, study, act cycles, which are this constantly turning wheel of improvement. And so it starts with a plan. And we met many times over Zoom. We, we, a lot of us knew each other already, but we were meeting over Zoom um, uh, uh, because of the pandemic. And it's just now we can really get some momentum going because we meet every two weeks um, uh, on a Friday morning. We have a sort of core group of um, uh, both clinicians and also uh, Duncan is, has been very uh, uh, instrumental in uh, sort of keeping us honest and keeping us on track. Um, with things go. But so the first thing we sort of figured out is, okay, well, what should we measure? And then we do, we try and measure it. And then we study, well, how did we do when we tried to measure that thing? Did we successfully measure that thing? Was it hard to do it? Was it easy to do it? What are the processes that we used to do it? And then we take this and we act and say, well, what should we do next? Have we solved this part of the system and we can move on to the next step in making the pizza? Or do we need to spin the wheel a few more times until we've improved this particular step. And so this is what's called a key driver diagram. And I'll walk you through it a little bit. It's, it's got some complicated pieces to it. Don't, don't get overwhelmed by it. The global aim again, improve the quality of life for adults with CP. Uh, again, this is the goal, this is what we wanna do, but how are we going to do it? So we decided the thing that we wanted to start with was looking at pain in adults with CP. And we said, well, even before we can really look at pain in adults with CP, we have to make sure that in our various clinics, and I'm in our uh, uh, work group, or uh, me and another uh, internist that I work with at Nationwide, there are phys med docs, there are neurologists. Um, in our clinics, we need to make sure that we're asking people if they have pain. So if we don't ask they have pain, then like, how are we going to fix it, right? Um, and we didn't want to just ask, do you have pain? But we also wanted to tie that into um, uh, function, okay? It's not, uh, uh, and, and, I, and Duncan, feel free to pipe in here. And I, I think you, your um, take on this may be similar to some other people, but there's pain and there's discomfort, and how are the two different? And really, what we also want to know is how do um, how does the pain affect a function? So, um, uh, you know, if you have pain, I, I'm sorry to hear it, but and we can work on pain control. But more importantly, if it's keeping you from doing something, we want to find a way to either mitigate the pain or get around the pain so that you can still do that thing. And so as our basic um, sort of unit of measurement, we said, are we in each visit that we are seeing an adult with CP, did we ask them if they have pain? And did we ask them if they had pain, how that affected their function? Let me, let me pause for a second and just, just dunk and see if you have anything you wanna uh, pipe in with. Uh, once again, uh, uh, for myself and for many that I talk to, and I've had the good fortune to 
be at the Paralympic level in terms of sport competition. And, um, uh, you know, everyone, as you said earlier, is 70% or more experienced pain. The real issue is uh, to what extent does that prevent the person from leading a, a quality life? In other words, actively participating in daily activities. So it, it has been um, uh, interesting to watch our group uh, develop uh, this standard of, of questions to, to go beyond the pain issue because everybody experiences pain a little bit differently. Uh, some might, I too for one person might be an eight for another person. The real issue is to what extent does the pain you experience have a uh, negative impact on your daily activities? So very important questions here. And Duncan, correct me if I'm wrong. Oftentimes, um, and I think Gary mentioned this, people just think that, wh why are you asking me if I have pain? Of course I have pain. Every day I have pain. I have pain all over my body, but I get up and I push myself and I do what I have to do. And um, so this contextualizes it differently because people just think that pain goes along with the condition because they've always had it. And, and also the fact that I think anyone else on this session today has, as part of their uh, encounter or their primary care physician, the intern, uh, the intake nurse will invariably ask, are you feeling pain today? Uh, how would you rate it one through 10? You give an answer and then they move on to another question. And when the primary care physician comes in, there's never any follow-up to, to the original pain question. And that's one of the things that I, uh, we'll talk a little about how the measurement and how we got to that, because I would say that the, the clinicians on the call, doctors and therapists recognize that we, we've not always done great in that area. Like we know that the nurse asks if there's pain and it's documented in the chart that the patient reported whether they had pain or not. But uh, it, you know, if we don't talk about it, if we don't ask about it, if we don't try to solve it, um, then really who cares whether the, the nurse asked about it. This is there, this June. Are there existing scales that blend what you're talking about, the, the functionality with the pain, so you get a better report of what's going on in terms of function and pain? Is there anything that exists out there? Yeah, yeah. And so I'm I'm gonna get to that actually just, just right. a little bit. I, I will say that I, I'm not I'm not wonderfully satisfied with what is out there, but but there is something. Um so the key a key driver diagram, uh, to some extent, uh, is how are you going to get to the things that are going to improve your smart aim? And to some extent, there are nouns and verbs here. And so a driver is something that either makes the process better or worse. And then the intervention is, well, how do you change that driver? So if the driver is that um, uh, the clinicians maybe don't know enough about how to assess for pain, then teaching physicians how to better assess for pain is an intervention that we would want to do. Um, if the clinicians don't think it's important, is there education we can do to help them realize how important it is? Um, if the, uh, and really what we ran into, one of the things was we were all asking the question sort of in our own way. I mean, we're, we're you know, none of us are, are robots and we all have different experiences and different ways of practicing. Um, and so we ask the question in different ways and we may get to different kinds of answers based on the way that we um, ask it. Do we have time in the visit to make these assessments? And important for the quality improvement 
uh, piece of this is do we document it in a consistent way so that we can find out whether we're sort of meeting the goal of asking more people about their uh, pain and functional uh, uh, problems. Um, and so uh, those are some of the drivers. We fill in more as we go. We have a couple of interventions that we've already um, uh, uh, put into place. Um, one is just really hashing out what we were talking about as a group. Um, a second thing was trialing what's called a smart phrase. This is an epic or electronic medical record kind of uh, uh, prompt to ask uh, uh, within our notes, not, um, not just uh, uh, do you have pain, but do you have pain that is impacting your function? And, and if it affects your activities, to what degree does it affect your activities? So this is that uh, uh, one measure that we use, which is called the Health Utilities Index 3, HUI 3. Um, and this was, uh, Darcy Failings was the, who was part of the network, uh, was the lead author on this. Uh, the paper's a, a bit older at this point, but essentially it was um, these patient report outcomes, filling in a box or clicking, a, clicking through a form uh, before the visit, do you have pain? If you do have pain, uh, would you rate it mild, moderate? Uh, does it prevent no activities? Does it pre prevent a few activities, some activities, or most activities? Okay. So um, this was the our, our choice anyway for what the uh, measurement was going to be. And so here's a, a look at the data. Um, and uh, I'll explain a little bit about what this data looks, uh, how, what this chart says and what it looks like and kind of where we're going with this. So first of all, on the uh, x-axis here is time. And we started out with uh, the way we grouped it. Um, and this is data combined from five centers, I want to say. Um, and we, block, we grouped it in two-week blocks because, especially in our center, we only have a our formal adult CP clinic every two weeks. And so we would have these weeks where we saw no patients. And so that made the data look kind of funny. So this um, groups the patients into two week uh, uh, intervals. And it says right here, how many patients were seen during those two weeks. And so during this most recent week, there were 11, uh, uh, the denominator, there were 11 patients that were seen that we could have asked about pain and function. Um, this on the on the y axis is how many did we successfully screen and our definition of successful screen was did you ask about pain and whether or not and how it affected activities so there's actually quite a bit of zero going back further because we um, had to collect a baseline and none of us were quite asking the question exactly like that and so it, it you know, really as a baseline, we were at zero. But then once we started um, talking about it, even just talking about it makes things better. And we see that pretty routinely uh, in quality improvement. Even before we, ex we even like agreed upon our definitions, which was here, put the smart phrase into uh, 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 effect, which was here, um, you started seeing some improvement. There are dips along the way. Might be interesting to want to go back and look and say, well, why out of these <laughs> six people did we only ask one of those six people? Like, uh, you know, was the like what happened that day? And sometimes it's a, you know, it could be a very good reason. Like a person who's not part of this project had to cover the clinic and uh, uh, you know hadn't you know hasn't learned the way to do things the way that we want them done. Um. And so then there's these points uh, that go across the green. Uh, I'm sorry, the, this solid red line through the middle is our mean. Okay. So across this time frame, we asked that question a mean of 60%. Well, we started at zero. So 60% is not bad. Um, the dotted lines are what's called the control intervals, and that is sort of a statistical thing having to do with the numbers of standard deviations away from the, the mean. But our goal was here, and we set this goal ahead of time that we wanted to get to at least 80%. And over the last three fortnights, um, we did uh, get above that 80%. And there are rules for these control charts where 
if you have a certain number of points above the mean, you can start shifting what we call the center line. And so if we have more numbers, if the next, uh, you know, through the end of the year, if we have all uh, numbers above 60%, when I, if I were to show you this graph again um, uh, down the road, um, you'd see that the red line will have shifted up somewhere around here. Exactly how far I don't know because we don't have all the points yet. And this is one of those things about quality improvement is that, you know, it, we have a feeling things are getting better, but we can't measure it yet. The data is being collected in real time. And just if you ever look at um, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, what they call run charts. It's nice when they have a green arrow that says, we want this number to get better because sometimes you measure something that you want to get smaller, but in this case, we want it to get better. So uh, this is the question that uh, we've been asking. Um, I'll say for myself, it, as, as a clinician, asking a person the question, it has felt strange because I, I, I'm thinking I saw a, a woman, mid forties, has CP, has pain, has kids, like a, to a toddler at least and a teenager. Um, her pain has worsened over the last couple of years having to do uh, primarily musculoskeletal things in her legs. Um, what I, and I, so what activities does it present? Uh, she has trouble standing and cooking. She has trouble carrying her toddler around. Um, uh, other things that she thinks are very important to her. Um, and then I said, okay, well, can you tell me that, is that a few activities? Is that some activities or is that most activities? You know, like in your view, ma'am, is it few, some, or most? Um, and they, she and her husband actually sort of thought about it for a while and came to, well, it's some, but it's really starting to border on most. Um, anyway, so I, I just want to, that's actually my last slide. I just want to leave it at that to say that, um, uh, it, it's a very small piece of a process that we've tackled so far. Um, uh, it hasn't changed yet what's going on in the clinic, because I still think that the, the doctors and the therapists who are seeing the patients, uh, you know, it's not like they still, they've always asked about pain and they've always asked about function and they've always hopefully tried to figure out ways to uh, alleviate pain and or um, mitigate the functional decline. Um, but have we, uh, are we doing it consistently and are we doing it in a way that we can track? That's sort of our first step towards trying to make this better. So thank you very much, Gary. That, that, was, that was great. And I, I would like to point out before we open it to questions is that this, uh, this 823 data point when we jumped out, uh, jumped up, one of the things we did was we did a focus group with a number of you that are on the, uh, on the webinar where we reached out and we had a set of questions about uh, experience with pain and, and experience with clinicians asking about pain and whatnot. So um, a lot of things get affected by just raising um, awareness. But I can't make the call that they do because they do it at 5 a.m. West Coast time. Uh, but I listened to it within uh, 24 to 48 hours later, and I heard Duncan at the very end. He is our consumer representative that sits on every call. Um, and Duncan, you said something that I thought was very powerful, and I thought it'd be great for you to share that with this group of people, and then we'll open it to questions. Well, what I shared with the group was that uh, for me, participation with uh, the professionals uh, gave me an insight into what they are doing, what they are learning, what they are uh, uh, trying to improve that will affect me. Um, we've talked on this call about the very complex matrix in terms of healthcare, PT, OT, uh, physician care. But consumers also have a very complex matrix in their daily life. And unfortunately, for the vast majority of us, the only time we interact is at that point of contact uh, when we're seeing our service provider. 
And so um, I encourage uh, the consumers on this call to outreach to other consumers, um, my CP, the CPR and um, network is, is very receptive to consumer input. And, and for me, it's been fantastic to see the amount of um, intellectual and emotional um, investment that the professionals make outside of my experience with them that ultimately uh, results in a, a much better quality of life for me. So uh, that insight has been invaluable to me personally. Thank you, Duncan. I appreciate that. I was really moved by your, your statement. So Gary and Mary, I know it's it's nine o'clock, but uh, I know that one of the benefits people get is a little bit of Q&A. And if you have the time personally to contribute, I see a thumbs up um, from Gary and Mary. Are you thumbs up as well? Great. So what I'd like to do is there were some questions that came up in the chat. Mary, you said you were going to answer one, and then I see one from Poonam. If you have a question, either put your, do the raise your hand function if that is actually working, maybe it's not working. Um, and, it, and if you can't raise your hand, just uh, put, say that you have a question in the chat and I will call on you. I see hands or I see clapping. So, um, but anyway, so anyway, go ahead. Uh, and I know some people will need to leave. So let me just say here, uh, Dr. Nortz, Dr. Gennady, thank you so much for these presentations and all the time you devote. And Duncan, as a, as a uh, community representative, I appreciate all that you do to help us uh, dial what we do. But let's open it up to, to questions. And I'm going to, Mary, I'm going to let you answer the question that's in the chat for starters. Uh, and then Poonam's question, and then we'll go to Chandler. Yeah, so someone said something about taking muscle relaxers but then losing the ability to ambulate, you know, and then what to do to get back um, on that. You know, muscles and bones and brains are plastic and they have capacity to change. Um, you know, your muscles might, how much they're going to bounce back, you know, we don't know, but always, you know, strengthening is great. And if you really want to improve function, you just don't want to strengthen. You can strengthen a specific way, which is power training, which is basically a movement that's, you know, as fast as possible in one direction and slow and controlled in the other direction. You want to be safe. So if you're doing like squat to stands, you can try and jump up and then go down really slowly, but you have to make sure your bones are really strong so you don't hurt yourself. So that's the concept of power training. Um, but muscles are plastic, and I would encourage you to try and strengthen yourself as much as possible, and just using, um, you know, and using using um, you know movements that are stimulate function, whether you're on a bicycle pedaling as fast as you can, or something like that. And uh, someone had asked uh, Mary about referrals of, of programs. I don't know if you can put anything in chat. I would tell people that. If you're doing uh, the MyCP fitness program through Staying Driven, Steph is a CrossFit trainer. Trainers, CrossFit is all about power and she's an adaptive fitness trainer. So you might want to ask her about, you know, sign up for MyCP fitness. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I don't think that, I wouldn't recommend, you know, just taking what I said and going on your own. I mean, no. this is something that you definitely could get a trainer. And I think that that would be a great advantage of MyCP is to get, on with staying driven and, and get some ideas for sure. Okay, um, I'm gonna go to uh, Chandler. Do you, if you wanna unmute and ask your question, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you so much for um, this presentation. It's been really helpful for me and my mom's also on the call as well. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, have you found that with the majority of adults who have pain, is that associated with spasticity, um, tight muscles, things like that? 
Um, uh, so I'll say for me and in, in my experience, uh, sometimes not, not, not exclusively. Um, uh, and part of it also, I think is the way that I, you know, I work, I'm, I'm an internist and so I'm, you know, yes, musculoskeletal stuff is important, but I deal a lot with headaches and belly pain and, uh, uh, pelvic pain and, um, uh, not just the musculoskeletal pain. And I usually have some partnership with a musculoskeletal provider, either physical medicine or orthopedics. And so there's a lot of it that comes from spasticity and that limits a lot of things, but it's by no means the only thing. And I just, my, my, my practice, I think that I have like as much people, uh, people that are limited as much by abdominal pain as uh, as they are as limited by uh, uh, knee pain or shoulder pain and so on. And I think that's, um, unfortunately, I don't have one of Mark Peterson's papers in front of me where he has population statistics, but Gary's absolutely right. The types of pain, you know, are variable from visceral pain, abdominal pain, musculoskeletal pain, and central pain. And I think that that's important to know, to note or differentiate, you know, when you are, that's part of what the providers are supposed to do, because there's different prevention and treatment pathways. Thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, I'm sorry. You want uh, me to answer Poonam's question? Uh, actually, Poonam had to sign off. So uh, there was a question from... I can still address it. From um, Rosary? Well, yeah. Um, I, Gary, Mary, if you want to read that, I'll read the question out loud. Do, uh, do you have pain and does it uh, affect function is sensible, but also stop the first question, especially pain. I'm sorry. Actually, I'm oh, not, can, not sure can... that that's a question. I take it back. So um, I, I do have a question, actually, Paul, but I can speak to my, I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear yeah. you. OK, sorry. This is Rosario. Yes. Thank you all very much. I'm delighted to be on this call. So I'm a 47 year old woman with CP. I've got a bit of an interesting history. Very briefly, I was working full time my whole life, but then I had various concussions due to falls in a motor vehicle accident. So now I'm dealing with my CP face on. But speaking to my comment, I was thinking about your, your questions that you were asking, Gary, etc. And it strikes me that one of the things that I've done is push through. Yeah. So I, I, I see that the value in you, you, you know, you kind of asking, do you experience pain and linking it to something really tangible? Like, how does it affect you, your your your, your day to day activities? But actually, that first bit's really important. Do you experience pain? And actually, do you ignore it? Because if people are ignoring it, which which I did, to some extent or have done um perhaps you know i may have done something slightly different which would have affected my state of play now you know what i mean um so that was that was that comment i, I would even take some time on that first bit when, when you're thinking about it um and i do have a question beyond that um mary i think mentioned um something there in response to the other person about plasticity and i've been reading up because i've ended up with all these nasty concussions and lost my career and whatever boohoo and all that but um i I've, I've found very little about plasticity in relation to cp so I, i'm really interested in finding out more about that is there research is there evidence uh, at a practical level how much plasticity do i have you know um, am <laughs> 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 happily my muscles you know yeah, I see my, this thing with the tone and the spasticity and, ah, I mean, I've had no intervention at all. I will say that. I, so I, I'm, I'm kind of only now looking into it myself. Thank you. Kathleen Friel at Columbia. Um, no, she's not at Columbia. She's at Burke Medical Center. Um, did actually, I think it was a combination of TMS and constraint induced therapy with adults with CP and saw changes on functional MRI and in function. So basically that means she was able to measure changes in brain plasticity with an intense intervention um, in adults with CP. So you, there, yes, there, there is hope. And you know there is hope also for, for muscles to improve. How fibrotic the muscles are, how small the muscle belly is, how much Botox you've had, you know, all of that plays a role, but, you know, we do have to believe in, there is plasticity. Um, everybody's going to have a limit, but, but certainly, um, for sure, there is emerging evidence for all the structures, brain, heart, muscle, 
in Bonn. Thank you. So, Who was the person you mentioned? I'll just take a note of that. Here, I'll, I'll write it. I'll write it. Thank I you. went to, it was a presentation. I don't know if she published it yet. And then, um, no, I think the, the last question we'll, we'll serve up for the night is from Margie. It says, if your providers aren't familiar with the visceral abdominal pain aspects, what would you point them towards so that CP aspects are addressed rather than incorrectly focusing on alternative explanations like uh, gynecological or organ-based issues? So I guess, is, is this a question about the central, uh, the central pain or is this a question just about you know, sort of misunderstanding about uh, sources of pain in CP. Mary, what was the, the... So I think that Gary is bringing it visceral, visceral abdominal um, has a lot to do with constipation, right? Gary? Yeah, well, so, so I'll just, I'll just say that, um, and, and when I am teaching, say, general internists about taking care of adults with CP, you know, I remind them most of what's taking care of an adult with CP is taking care of an adult, um, because adults with CP get all the same can get all the same things that uh, uh, any adult can, um, and so I, it's a lot. It's a bit of, in my mind, threading the needle of saying, okay, well, uh, this person's coming into me with abdominal pain, and they may have sort of what I would call the regular. Uh, causes of abdominal pain, whether it's bowel-related inflammatory bowel disease, you know, gallstones, pancreatitis, uh, appendicitis, any any uh, gastritis, ulcers, any one of those things. Um, and I do think that uh, a person presenting with a new complaint needs a a thorough evaluation, which doesn't mean necessarily a lot of testing, but a careful history and physical and uh, the right amount of testing to exclude those kinds of things, which need to be fixed. But um, our, I would say my, our patients that have underlying neurological conditions are more likely to have some central component to their pain, some visceral component to their pain in the sense that um, it's not, the, the extent of the pain can't be explained by the sort of uh, objective physical findings, which is not to say, oh, the, I mean, yes, the pain's in your head because your brain is, is uh, very much involved in both the genesis and the interpretation of the pain signals. Um, but um, uh, uh, so I, I think when we, we often sort of start with, okay, well, let's make sure you don't have uh, something that you know needs to be addressed by a surgeon or a gastroenterologist or uh, something like this, a gynecologist. But then uh, when we've sort of done those things and you're still having pain, um, let's talk about you know where does it localize? how how is it experienced, and how can we um, affect what essentially is an aberrant nerve uh, brain connection um, uh, that we we really, we truly don't completely understand. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. Robrook's an, an, uh, an expert in this too, um, so I don't want to um, uh, say it all. But um, yeah, so it's it's it, it's sort of both ways. We know that we know that uh, somatic pain or nociceptive pain, which is like actual tissue being injured, um, uh, happens as well as these other kinds of pain, which are it feels like tissue is being injured. Okay. I, uh, at um, 9.15 or 9.13 East Coast time, I, everybody's been very generous with their time. Uh, Dr. Gennady, Dr. Noritz, I want to thank you both so much for your time. Thank you to all of you uh, from the community that help us get to focusing on the right things. Greatly appreciate it. And I hope you take away thank that you. we're we're quite focused on the challenges uh, and what you think is important, and we hope to make continuous progress. So thanks, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for your support. Good to see you all. Thank you all. Bye. Take care. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Norris. Yeah, see you, Mary. Bye-bye.